ever asked yourself the question why we worship God? Is it because he's some narcissistic old man up in the sky who just wants to hear how good he is all the time? Is that why we worship God? It's what some people think. It's what atheists and cynics think. But that's not why we worship God. I think the reason we worship God is because it opens our eyes and our hearts to wonderful truths about who God is. So we sing those words and remind ourselves about who he is, about what he does, about how he works. Worship, when we direct it towards God, is prayer. Worship and prayer are interconnected. And when we pray, when we worship, it helps us grow in intimacy. It helps us grow in connection and understanding of God. But I think praise and worship does even more. I think that when we worship God and pray to him, it helps us realize or have an experience of God that transforms us and might even transform the world around us. So in this talk, what I would like to talk through and discuss with you is that connection between worship and prayer and how when we worship Jesus as he is revealed, there is power power in our prayers. So with that in mind, won't you pray with me as we pray for the message? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would come and speak through your word, that you would come and speak through uh, your spirit, that you would direct us, teaching us how it is that we might experience you and encounter you in fresh ways, in old ways, but always in ways that draw us closer to you. Please, Lord, come and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before I uh, go on about prayer, I just want to remind you, we have a hangout afterwards, right? So don't leave, don't rush out of here, stay around. We've got our cake packages for our uh, college-aged students that we're going to sign. There'll be donuts. Uh, Just make sure you hang around afterwards and and connect with a couple of people. Uh, You might be surprised who lives in your town and you get to know others, right? So make sure you do that. We're continuing through the series on prayer and we're continuing in our Matthew uh, passage. And what we're looking at in in our Matthew passage is uh, this encounter that Jesus has as he comes into Jerusalem. We're about two thirds of the way through Matthew, but the last third is all around one week in Jesus' life, the week leading up to the crucifixion. And this passage that we're gonna look at dives into uh, this experience where we see worship at play. So have a look, have a look at the, these, uh, um, uh, the, these passages as we think about who Jesus is and, and what worship looks like. Here, Jesus in, in Matthew 21, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, Say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Uh, the cynic side of me, Jesus is encouraging his, uh, his uh, band of brothers, his disciples, his followers, his gang to go and steal a colt. <laughs> now, we know that's not really what happens, but like, can you imagine being an owner watching two guys walk in, untie a colt and walk away with it? Like, yeah, you're gonna have some questions. But when they respond, Jesus encourages them to use this word Lord. Jesus reusing this title for himself. He encourages uh, his followers to say that to others. And there's a sense that maybe he's sending uh, these people to a known person, a known town. Jesus used to uh, travel through this area on a regular basis over his three years of ministry. So he was probably known. But this word Lord in Greek is kurios, and it can mean a number of different things. Uh, it can just mean sir or master or someone in charge. But there's another component to it, which is what you would use when you were referring to your master, if you were a slave, it was your absolute master, the one who is in control of you. And what you're gonna see in this passage is people who have a view of Jesus as good sir, but we're gonna encounter the Jesus who is the absolute master, the one worthy of our worship. So as they continue, so this Uh, Matthew tells us that this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. The prophet is uh, is Zechariah. Say to to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle 
and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That image is quite important because you see the way Jesus was perceived by many of the followers, he said he was potentially, maybe, we know he was this esteemed rabbi, we know he had performed miracles, but maybe he was the Messiah. Maybe he was this anointed ruler who was going to come in and with power overthrow the Roman rulers, overthrow the oppression that the nation of Israel was under. Yet this prophecy talks about a king coming in peace. Because that image of riding on a donkey was, a, was an image that was often used for kings who were coming to barter for peace, coming to barter for uh, negotiations. It wasn't a victorious entry. That's not how kings arrived when they were going to battle or to war. Uh, they arrived in different ways. So here, Jesus is coming as a person seeking peace, seeking reconciliation. And Matthew wants to pick that up uh, in the passage and wants us to note that. Well, as he continues, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd who was following Jesus caught wind of this, and so they spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Uh, the good Christians amongst us, if you're online, you see how fast you can type it. Why, what do we call this day in the Christian calendar? Palm Sunday. Because the people went and cut down palms and went and wafted them over. And we celebrate that today uh, in faith community by giving little kids a little a, a palm front. And uh, the more adventurous ones run around and try to beat each other with them. Uh, kind of didn't get the peace side of the equation. But you get the point, right? They want to celebrate this, this king arriving. They want to have this, what is called the triumphal entry. And that's a key word, triumph, which we'll see in a little bit. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. There's something significant here that they're tapping into. Jesus is coming. We want him to save us. We want him to redeem us. We want him to uh, release us from this oppression. So they use a great Jewish word, a Hebrew word, Hosanna. Save us, is what it means. What they're doing is worshiping Jesus. They're engaging in worship. They are responding to him with, with praise and adoration and, and declaring him as this son of David, this victorious ruler, this person in a lineage that uh, we were told would always have a king on the throne. That's who uh, they are highlighting and picking up on. That's who they are talking to. That's who they are worshiping. And when you look at those words, they're prayers. And there's something happening in the midst of this that is powerful. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred at this triumphal entry. And they asked, who is this? Now, there's a little trap in that word. Going back to that day, when they said, who is this? Well, you have to be very careful how you answer that because if you say he's a conquering king, you don't kind of say that to the Roman legion, right? But the other people were confused. They weren't too sure who was this Jesus. He could be this rabbi. He could be uh, the Messiah. He could be a conquering hero. We've honored him in that way. But what do we know about him? Well, the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So there's this image of Jesus, this imperfect vision of who he is yet when the pharisees and the teachers of the law heard this praise and worshiping offered to jesus in luke we're told they go to jesus and say you need to stop them from doing this you need to put an end to this they should not worship you this way and jesus responds in a profound way he turns to them and says if they didn't worship me the stones would worship me creation would cry out. Some commentators say that when Jesus spoke about the stones, he was actually standing next to a memorial of the stones that showed the nation coming in to the promised land that was set up by Joshua. When he says, if you don't worship me, these stones will cry out and declare who I am. Matthew puts this in because he wants us to know worship is important. Worship is significant. 
it's important because Matthew includes it in the gospel that Jesus was worshipped as this uh, uh, incoming king. It's important because Jesus welcomed it. He said, you need to do it. And if you don't do it, the stones will cry out. It's important because worship is prayer. And we know that prayer is a conversation with God. I think somehow as churches and as religious leaders, uh, we've kind of created prayer to be this hard to reach, hard to understand, hard to uh, contemplate aspect of Christianity. And so we, we, you, we, we re, uh, read prayers and we say prayers that are lengthy and complicated and sound profound and wonderful, but are inaccessible to people, as opposed to prayer being a conversation. It's kind of like going to a spouse and saying, how do you talk to your partner? Like, that's what we're saying. How, I don't know how to pray. Well, can you talk? I love how uh, John Ortberg talks about this. He says, do you worry? Well, then you can pray. You anxious about something? Well, then you can pray. You happy about something? You can pray. Because prayer is a conversation. And there are times when our prayer moves within us and is captured in such a way that it becomes with rhythm, and with rhyme, it becomes song. And some of those songs have been written and captured through the ages, and we sing them over and over again. But at their heart, they were prayers offered up to God by people who had an encounter with Him. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I don't remember the words right now, but Oceans, the where's our worship team? Oceans, some of the some of what that song goes through, some of the songs you just sang this morning and we'll sing again. There are prayers lifted up to God. So here's my question. If worship, back in Matthew, where Jesus says the stones are gonna cry out if they don't worship, if that worship was based on an imperfect vision of Jesus, a, a not clear picture of who he is, if that worship was acceptable by Jesus, if that worship was encouraged by Jesus, how much more would our worship be encouraged by Jesus and welcomed by Jesus? How much more would our worship be impactful if we worshiped as Jesus is revealed in Scripture? If we had a picture, a full picture, a better understanding, a fuller understanding of who Jesus is. So I want to unpack that for you a little. I want to talk about who Jesus is a little. Because what do we know about Jesus post the triumphal entry? post the crucifixion, post the resurrection. Who is Jesus that we worship? Jesus we worship as the conqueror of death. Wow, I thought that would get a better reaction. <laughs> we are a little inured to that because it's just, it's good Christianese, right? But for the early church, Jesus conquered death. He overwhelmed it. This is what Paul writes in Corinthians, to the end of Corinthians, after sending them a lot of hard uh, conversations, a lot of hard challenges, and he talks about how the end will come when Jesus hands over the kingdom to the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, all authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death scares us because it is so final. If you've lost a loved one, you know exactly what that means. It's final. They're gone. You can't talk to them anymore. You can't be hugged by them. You can't hug them. You can't lay eyes on them. It's final. It's scary for us. But what Paul is saying is that Jesus has conquered death. And so what is a gravestone for many people becomes a stepping stone for Christians. That's the power of this. Don't worry about people talking in the kitchen. Jesus is the conqueror of death. That's who Matthew reveals him to us as. He's also revealed as the purifier of the sin that infects us. John writes, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. One of the great images of sin in the Bible is it's like a ink blot, an infection that scars us, that, that uh, gets put on us and is a disfigurement. 
But Jesus comes along and pays the price for sin, and we are cleaned of our sin, our brokenness, our, uh, our, our uh, hardship, our willful intent, our rebelliousness. But also we are purified of other hard, uh, harm that is done to us by others who have sinned. Jesus purifies us of all of it. This is the thing that I wish we would get as Christians and stop trying to tell people to do better and be good and clean their act up in order to be acceptable by, by God. You don't have to clean your act up. You are already acceptable because God is the one who cleans you. He purifies you. That's the Jesus we worship, the one who purifies sin. Paul writes, he says, there is no sin that is too great for the grace of God to overcome. Jesus is the purifier of sin. Well, how about this one? The resurrected Lord. Before he talks about conquering death, here yeah, Paul lays out the following uh, proof of the resurrection. Now, today we might ask for DNA evidence or medical records or a doctor's account. Back in that day, the proof of, a, of an event was not one eyewitness, but at least two. If you had two eyewitnesses to an account, it was acceptable as legal evidence in a court of law. So here Paul lays his evidence. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me, that the Messiah died for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. He removed them exactly as scripture tells it, that he was buried, that he was raised from death on the third day. Again, as scripture says, really prove it, Paul. Okay, that he presented himself alive to Peter. Then to his closest followers, the disciples, and later to more than 500 of his followers all at the same time. Most of them still around, although some, a few have since died. But you can go and ask these eyewitnesses. They saw the resurrected Lord, that he then spent time with James and the rest of those he commissioned to represent him, and that he finally presented himself alive to me. Not one eyewitness, not two eyewitnesses, 502, 500, uh, plus another 10, so 512, uh, plus James, 513. 513 eyewitness accounts to the resurrected Jesus. Overwhelming evidence that he's resurrected. When we worship, when we sing songs on Sunday morning or in your car as you're listening to Caleb or listening to your Spotify list, when we are worshiping Jesus, we would do well to remind ourselves he's alive. He's not a figment of our imagination. He's not some made up God that we, that we follow. He is alive. And when you worship him, whether you're driving or walking or running or lying in bed, whether it's as you wake up or as you go to sleep, Jesus is there with you. That's who you worship. Man, if we could capture that. And I don't... I don't want to sound like the pastor says, I have the truth and you guys need to get there. I'm really talking to myself, man, if I could capture how powerful that image is, what that would mean when we sing songs. And I'm talking as somebody who isn't a singer. I'm very jealous of you artists who can sing. Very jealous. When you sing, I spend my time trying to find the note. And you guys just waft in so easy and, you know, I'm, I... I don't know how many notes there are, but I'm telling you now, I know twice as many because I just make them up. <laughs> but when we worship Jesus as the resurrected Lord, there is something powerful in that, which is why the early church called him the Messiah, not because he conquered Rome and overthrew it, but because he conquered all powers, all authorities, all dominions. So Paul says, as he was his custom, uh, Luke writes, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah, the anointed one, the one you are hoping for, had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, is what Paul argues. He is the one you're looking for. That's why in Luke 2, when he writes about the birth of Jesus, which we read often, but we read it in the mindset of Christmas, what he wants us to pay attention to are these words. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. 
the Lord, and he uses the word kurios there, mean the absolute master, the owner of everything, the creator of everything, the Lord. He's powerful. So he's the Lord, he's the savior, he's the conqueror of death, the purer of sin, purifier of sin, the resurrected Lord, the Messiah, which is why he is declared in Revelation as the king of kings. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings and with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. That's who we worship. That's the revealed Jesus. Not just some teacher, not just a good guy. The resurrected Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He deserves our worship. And you know the amazing thing? We get to worship Him every day. Not have to, you get to. You get to worship Him. So when you worship Jesus, when I worship Jesus, when we worship Jesus as he is revealed, I think our prayers take on a different dimension. I think our prayers become, uh, uh, there's power in our prayers, not because of the words we say, not because of a special formula or technique that we follow, not because of any method of interaction, but because of who we are praying to because of who we are worshiping. Prayer changes because of who Jesus is. Our worship helps us see him in that way, but our prayer changes. So worship is prayer and it focuses on Jesus as savior. It focuses on Jesus as Lord. It focuses on Jesus as the sacrificial lamb. It focuses on Jesus as the triumphant conqueror. Jesus as the way to the father, which is why Paul writes this in Colossians. And having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a, a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, if you've ever done any Christian reading and, and you know the word, the atonement, the atonement stands for the work that Jesus did on the cross. And there are lots of theories about the atonement. One of the most common theories today comes from kind of the church world that we're uh, in the tradition of that turns the, the atonement into uh, the penal substitution theory. There was a penalty for sin, Jesus paid that penalty. He substituted uh, my uh, price that I should have paid. He paid the price for me, so he became my substitute. You know, that, that's what it means, the penal substitution theory. You know, that wasn't the dominant theory at the time immediately after Jesus. The dominant theory was called the triumphal theory. That Jesus, as he writes in Colossians, took all power, all authority, all dominion, all the things that stood opposed to God, and he nailed them to the cross and conquered them. They worshiped a conquering Jesus, not a lamb that somehow uh, changes my place. He was powerful, he was Lord, he was master. So no sin, no uh, obstacle, no disease, nothing could stop that uh, from over, being overcome. And so when they prayed, they prayed with a, with a focus on Jesus, you've already conquered, so just reveal it here. And when you read the prayers of the early church, they're not really significant. You know, they're not specifically powerful. The words seem weird, but there is power in them. Like, have a look at this. Uh, uh, I want to read to you uh, from Acts 16. It's a lengthy section, but I want to read to you the prayers that the early church prayed. This is in Acts 16. This is the birth of the Philippian church. About midnight, Paul and Silas, who had been arrested for casting a demon out of a slave girl. They were thrown in prison. It's about midnight. They're in the prison. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Don't get distracted by worship style. For those of you who are hymn lovers, it doesn't mean hymns are more powerful than other songs. It's just they were singing hymns and praying to God. And the other prisoners were complaining. No, that's not what the passage says. The other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors, all the prison doors flew open. <laughs> I guess I'm excited. All the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. It's 
not just a natural earthquake. The chains fell off. The jailer woke up, you think? It was his house that was shaking. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all still here. The jailer called for lights, rushed into the prison and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Of course he fell trembling. Why were the prisoners still there? He then brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they teach him about Jesus. He commits his life to Christ. He becomes baptized. He joins a woman who was a wealthy woman called Lydia and they become the early church called Philippi, Philippians. The church in Philippi. Because Paul and Silas It might be next door. It's because Paul and Silas were praying and worshiping. That's what sparked that whole thing. When we worship Jesus as the conquering hero, as the revealed triumphant God, something happens in our prayers. Early in Acts, listen to what happens early in Acts. Peter and John were were captured by the Sanhedrin, put in prison. They were questioned all night. They get released because they can't find anything wrong with them. So Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When these people, they reported back to heard this, they raised their voices together and prayed to God. Listen to their prayer. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations raise and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. It's not a particularly special prayer, is it? They quote a little bit of Old Testament uh, scripture. They call on God and ask him to help them. Here's the result. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. When you worship the resurrected Christ and you pray to the resurrected Christ, there's power in your prayers. There are commitments that come in your prayer. There's a community growth and encouragement. You are filled with the Holy Spirit when, you have, when this happens. And out of what comes in your life is boldness and courage to speak the, the truth and the life of God and the love of God to people around you. Which is why in Revelation, we get this amazing picture in Revelation. People are afraid of Revelation because it's got scary imagery in it. But here's, for me, one of the most significant pictures in Revelation. We're told about a throne that John sees. And around the throne, he sees four living creatures with six wings covered with eyes all around. And all day, night, all day and night, these creatures move around the throne. And they, they say the following, holy, which means other. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. All the time, there's worship in heaven around the throne. Later on, we get told that uh, in that same picture that whenever these living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Jesus, the, the one who sits on the throne, whenever they worship him, the elders who are sitting around, there's a picture of elders, 24 of them, representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. The elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him. And they say the following, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their beings. You are victorious, you are powerful, you are significant. So later on in his vision, John says, I looked and there before me, around the throne, 
was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels who were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Do you get the picture that's happening in Revelation in heaven? There's a throne where Jesus sits and everything revolves around him and everybody worships him. When we worship Jesus as the one who sits on the throne, there is something that happens in our prayers that changes, that is significant. It's, uh, at some level, it's hard to explain and understand because there's power that comes out. In the middle of a worship service, I remember going forward, I was working for Youth for Christ at the time. I was some 20 something who thought I knew everything, but really, really I knew nothing. But I was, in, I was part of the, the team and we're told when worship is happening, go forward and go to the front. And when somebody comes with a prayer request, pray for them. So I did it, went forward, stood around, looking around. Oh, here's somebody, they came forward. Hey, can you tell me what you need prayer for? Person had a stutter. They couldn't get past the first sentence, first word of the first sentence. You know what happened to me? I got irritated. <laughs> I was like, I want to hear your prayer request. Like, this is, I could feel the frustration in me going as the person just stuttered over and over again, couldn't get to it, couldn't get to it. I was like, oh my word. So eventually I was like, because, you know, I'm a lot like Peter, I jumped before I look. I looked at the person and said, can I just pray for your stutter, please? Because now I was irritated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they nodded their head. So I prayed for their stutter. Finished praying, said, now, what's your prayer request? And they looked at me and they went, that was it, I'm done. And they walked away. I was like, what? God removed their stutter like that. And they didn't even have to ask for it because they couldn't get it out. But somehow my irritation led me to the right prayer request. But that's the power of the Holy Spirit pouring on that person. But there's story after story I've heard of people prayed for. Uh, that was instantaneous, but I've heard of faith groups who prayed for people for 10 years and let the power come through over 10 years of prayer. I've heard stories of parents praying for their children through hardship and, and struggle and watching them find their way through. There is something that happens when we worship God. So I have a question for you. Do you want your prayer? Do you want your prayers? Do you want our prayers as a community to be like those recorded in scripture? Do you want your prayers to have power and influence and impact like that? Then the step to that is to worship Jesus as he is revealed. Not as we make him up to be. Worship Jesus with the focus, energy, and passion that is his due because he is the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the God and salvation belongs to him. Worship him in that way. And it's why... We want you to pray the breakthrough prayer because I want you to look at how we start the breakthrough prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, the powerful, triumphant, conquering, purifying, resurrected Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, show me who I can love radically today. And as we sing about that, and as we pray that, as we worship him, who knows what God might do through you today and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday? Who knows what conversations might happen through you, what prayers might happen through you? Who knows how God might heal you and uh, perform some miracle for you? Who knows? But the follower, what our job is, is to keep going back. Dear Lord Jesus, Show me who I can love radically today. So I want to invite you. I want to invite you as we close our service to sing with that sort of belief. Don't fake it. If you don't have it, don't fake it.
But if you believe that Jesus is resurrected, if you believe he's powerful, if you believe he is the triumphant Lord who has power over these things, I want to invite you to stand and as the band comes up, to sing with power and then let's close our service together when Andrew comes up. I'll just ask you, Andrew, to pray the breakthrough prayer for us at the end. And then let's leave here with that sense of having met with Jesus and going in to the power and into the world that needs the resurrected Lord overseeing it. Can we do that together? Sound good? Let's stand and worship.